Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined by Ia Deris. Hi. And Sam Spieler. Hi. Today, we are reviewing the second book in our campus novel series, Stoner by John Williams. The first book was Donna Tartt's The Secret History, which we reviewed and discussed over the last two weeks. The last book in our series will be Philip Roth's The Human Stain, which we will tackle two weeks from now. Since this is a review of Stoner, we won't reveal any spoilers. If you haven't read the book yet, keep on listening. If you want to join our discussion, you can find our book club on Reddit by searching for Canonical Pod, one word. And we are also on social media at Canonical Pod. So let's start by talking about why Stoner is important. Before we get too far ahead, we should talk a little bit about what this book is about. The thing that everyone knows about Stoner is how much everybody doesn't know Stoner. It was a very forgotten novel when it was published in 1965. It was published and very quickly fell out of print. It was published again, I believe, in 1972, fell out of print again, and was rediscovered several decades later on. It's become a hit now in Europe, and it's gradually becoming more and more famous here in the U.S. The novel is the third novel published by John Williams. Like the main character, William Stoner, Williams was a professor of English literature who spent his career teaching at the University of Denver. The novel Stoner traces the life of William Stoner from his life on the farm, his poor and tough upbringing, and his eventual attendance at the University of Missouri, his love affair with English literature, entering graduate school, and then later on the personal difficulties he has with his family, his wife Edith and their difficult marriage, his relationship with his daughter, and then the professional difficulties he has teaching and dealing with his colleagues at the university. In most ways, it's an unrelentingly bleak novel that shows a lot of struggle, and it also shows a character who doesn't always react in any way to the struggles in his life. But in some readers' opinion, at least in my opinion, it shows the possibility for a life that is missing all of the outward signs of success to be redeemed and for dignity to be found even in the life of a person who seems totally mediocre. Why should people read this book? I think this book is important because it's a beautiful book and a meaningful book. It's something that says a lot about being a human being, and it says something very affecting, but also in an unsentimental way. It's something that people can really appreciate very sincerely. I think it's also interesting historically, just because the novel had been forgotten for a long period of time and then rediscovered, there's some curiosity there. I agree with all your points, Yed. I think that it's a very well-written book, and it's so well-written that it's one of those books you might actually be able to teach in a literature class or an MFA program, so that people will see you know, how to structure a very specific kind of story. I think it's important for that reason. I also think it's important because it's a kind of book that we don't really read nowadays in its structure. It's a very plain book. And having that is important because it's kind of like the ginger on a sushi plate. It kind of cleanses your palate a bit and makes you think about maybe how other books that you're reading are um, very different from this book. I think it's important for that reason. I would say, though, that for all of this talk about it being important, I'm not sure that it is important in any of the senses that we've used that word in this podcast before. I don't think it's socially important. I don't think it's artistically important in the sense that it can show a writer something about craft that he wouldn't see otherwise. I think it's a very quiet and unassuming book, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was forgotten for so long. But I think that it's not one of these novels that's trying to burst upon the scene and make a name for itself or make a name for its writer. 
It's very unostentatious. Yeah, that's the word for it. I think that's part of what makes it difficult for me to love, even though I enjoyed it, and makes it hard for me to recommend it to a lot of people. I loved the book. I think the book is wonderful. Absolutely. I liked it. And there were certain sections that I did love. But as a whole, I'll say that it's not the type of book I normally would gravitate toward. I guess I'll be the dissenter here. I didn't like the book. I completely appreciated its technical qualities. I think it's so well written, but I found reading it extremely difficult. Not because it was a badly written book. Once again, technically, it's really good. But because I was not involved in the subject matter as much, and it was so painful to read that it was a real slog. In order to read the book, you have to kind of harden your heart against what was happening to Stoner. You know, it was actually physically, like, painful for me to read the book. It's a book full of disappointments, one after the other. That definitely makes sense. Yeah, you're right. It totally reminded me of my own life, and I'm trying to read to get away (laughs) from it, Sam. What I'm curious about here, since you brought it up, is when you were so disappointed or pained by reading about his disappointment, why do you count that as a negative rather than part of the artistry of the novel? I think it's not that I'm counting it as a negative. So once again, I think it's technically really well executed. What I mean is on the level of enjoyment, you know, sometimes you read a book not just because you want to be satisfied intellectually, sometimes you read it because you want to enjoy something. Um, this book is not enjoyable. It is extremely painful. For me, the analogy I would use is it's a bit like eating bitter melon. There's actually two meanings here, because in Chinese, eating something bitter is kind of like a hardship you have to endure. And that's what the book is. It's a book about hardships you endure. But it's also like eating bitter melon in that Chinese families will entice young children to eat it by saying it's good for you. It's a book that you read because you think it's good for you. It's going to feed you something, either some wisdom about craft or some kind of intellectual feast. But it is so difficult to swallow because it just is extremely unpleasant. It's very difficult because you empathize so much with Stoner and he just keeps on getting beaten down. On top of that, It's written in this kind of, I'd say, very boring style. So it's not engaging. You have to really force yourself, I think, to kind of push through. But once again, technically, it's really proficient. So because of that, you're not really, you never think this book is bad. It's just this book is not enjoyable on that surface level. Here, I I think that you're talking a lot about the technical proficiency of Williams as a novelist. And I think that that's true, but I also think that there are other pleasures to be had with this book. I think that it does offer a message to the reader as a human being, something that I, as a reader, can appreciate without thinking about being a writer or any sort of craft issues. There is something in the novel that I want to share. It's kind of what I would consider the thesis statement of the novel. Uh, In this particular scene, William Stoner is talking to his mentor, another teacher at the university called Archer Sloan. And Sloan says to Stoner, You must remember what you are and what you have chosen to become and significance of what you are doing. There are wars and defeats and victories of the human race that are not military and that are not recorded in the annals of history. I count this as something like a thesis statement because it's showing to the reader this idea that even if a life is not distinguished in the ways that we normally would think of a life being distinguished in war or through professional accomplishment, there is a a dignity and a satisfaction to be had even in a life that seems otherwise mediocre. So when you say, oh, it's very bitter and unpleasant to see Stoner fail so often, I have to disagree and I say, yes, he does fail. But at the end, there is a a kind of an epiphany that the, the reader, I think, kind of gets to in advance of Stoner, but especially at the end of the novel, 
I think he realizes that his hardship was not actually as meaningless as it might have seemed. I think that the book advocates for a kind of stoic endurance. And philosophically, I'm interested in this kind of stoicism, but I don't think I would advocate for this kind of stoicism. I find myself kind of wanting to shake Stoner and telling him, like, what's wrong with you? You are an incredibly passive man. And especially because we read this so soon after reading uh, the books in our series on race, you know, we spent so much time talking about activism and about like changing the world. This is the opposite. It is saying the world will be incredibly difficult on you. You just need to endure. I actually think that message is incredibly dispiriting. And I find that if this is sort of the life lesson that you can take from the book, I'm not sure that's the life lesson that is all that worthwhile. It sounds to me that James is much more of an optimist than I am. What do you think, Sam? Is this a message that readers should be paying attention to, or is it something that you agree with James on? Something that came to mind, I read an interview with him where he talks about that a work of fiction is not necessarily there to reflect the reader, that students often come into literature thinking that all books must reflect them. And this was his kind of thesis statement against that. This is not a character that reflects most people. And I think that's part of why this book faded into obscurity for so long, is that there's not a whole lot to attach to for most readers. They are not going to see themselves for the most part, in Stoner and his actions. Certainly people have their own hardships, but they probably have a little bit more activism in their own lives than he does in his. It's true that he is a very stoic sort of person, but I don't think he is necessarily a caricature of passivity, you know? He, I think, to the novel's credit, is drawn very carefully. I think that Williams is able to navigate between the impossible heroics that we might associate with a typical hero going to war and doing amazing things and the crude indulgence that we might find with kind of a layabout character who just satisfies his own base interests and doesn't think about a higher purpose. He's neither of those two extremes, And because of that very narrow way that Williams has characterized him, I don't see him as this kind of ridiculous character of passivity. I think he's a person who has a certain sort of perspective and a certain sort of relation to the world, which, as Sam has said, it's it's very different from my own, but I can respect that it's different from my own. And I think that the accomplishment of the novel is that the theme that I see about how to live a good life or how to live a a life with dignity on your own terms is so well realized. Whether it's the way that I would choose to live or the way that I want to live, it's kind of immaterial to my appreciation of the novel because it addresses that theme which is so big and so important and it just nails it. This is a bit tangential, but I'll also add one thing that made it really difficult for me as a father of two daughters. The conflict he has with his wife and the loss of control when it comes to his daughter and how much he can be in his daughter's life, I found that incredibly painful and difficult in a good way because, you know, the novel actually made me feel extremely pained. Yeah. It was difficult to read because it was so painful. But at the same time, it's the kind of thing where when I read that, I think, I don't really understand this man. Like, I know what you mean, Iyad, but I don't understand him. In a way, he has become so unrealistic that I'm taken out of the novel. It goes back to what you were saying about wanting to shake him. I felt the same way, especially in his dealings with his daughter, that he gives up so easily. 
capitulates to Edith, his wife, so easily and doesn't put up any sort of fight for the most part. I don't think I've met anyone that is that much of a pushover, that less of an agent in their own lives. To put it another way, I would say that Williams seems to prioritize the aesthetic argument here over realism. Like, I found it very unreal in that instance. And also in a few other instances, I just found it unbelievable. But aesthetically, I understand it because that is what he's going for as a writer. He is trying to espouse this certain kind of philosophy about life. But it kind of makes me an unbelieving reader. It kind of pushes me out. I think that the two of you may lack a certain degree of empathy when it comes to Stoner's character. I think that he does seem passive, and he does seem like he's not putting up a fight. But I think the issue is that he has been so emasculated at that point in his life that it's very difficult for him to react in the ways that you two might have. Because early in the novel, he has the chance to fight in World War I, and he chooses not to. So he's already lost that sort of masculine credibility by fighting for his country. And then his wife, Edith, also marries him, and she's kind of marrying down. She comes from a wealthy family. Her father, I think, is an executive or the owner of a bank. And she marries somebody who has very modest income. And they have to borrow money from his father-in-law in order to buy their house. So he's always kind of under her thumb and under his father-in-law's thumb, throughout the whole middle of the novel. And I think that that's substantial. And I think that because of that pressure, he's not as free to respond to the way that she's manipulating his daughter, Grace, as he might be otherwise. I think that, to me, is a significant aspect of who he is that maybe you're not giving enough credit. I didn't see his not going to war as something that particularly bothered him. When people came back from the war, there was some mention in the book that that was something on people's mouths about him, about Stoner. It didn't seem like he was that perturbed from what I remember. I don't think it was something that was like keeping him up at night, but it was a mark of distinction. You know, at the party that they have when Gordon Finch introduces him to Edith, He's still wearing his military uniform, and everyone, when the soldiers come back, is very full of praise and optimism, and, you know, they're all marching around the campus when the armistice has been signed, and he's just there. He seems very impotent at that moment, and I think that it's tough to separate how we feel reading the novel with how he felt living that experience, but... It does feel that he distinguishes himself in his mind from his friends Gordon French and Dave Masters, who were studying with him at the University of Missouri, and then both chose to go off to war, and he chose not to. It occurs to me that there are very few moments in his life where he wasn't impotent. If you start from the beginning, he starts living for himself when he discovers his love of literature, and he eventually stands up for himself and says, this is what my life is going to be. But including that moment, there are, maybe I can count on one hand the times that he stands up for himself or says actively what he wants. Well, he's definitely not impotent when he impregnates his wife. That's a keeper. You gotta leave that. Okay. (laughs) So, it seems like I like this book much more than you did, both of you. And I went out looking to find some criticism of the novel. And the most prominent criticism that I found comes from uh, Professor Elaine Showalter. And she wrote a review in the Washington Post. Her take is primarily political. She disagrees with the way that Williams characterizes uh, Stoner's wife, Edith. 
I think Edith is not characterized as completely as Showalter would have liked, and this seems to make him sort of a misogynist. And she also disagrees with the way that the two quote-unquote villains of the novel are both disabled people. One is a fellow professor at the university who is hunchbacked, and the other is a PhD student at the university who has some sort of a problem with his arm and his leg. And she thought that that was kind of a caricature of disability villainy. I don't think that her criticism is terribly valid, particularly with response to Edith, just because that's just one person and not all characters in a novel can be as well developed as the main characters. Uh, with regard to Lomax and Walker, the two disabled people, it does become a little bit more valid of a criticism only because those are two very prominent unsympathetic characters in the novel, and they both have the same trait. I understand Showalter's argument here, but I disagree a little bit. I more agree about Edith, actually. I did feel she was a bit of a caricature, and yet I could understand her motivations. She's kind of the victim of this patriarchal society. She is just passed off to this man who, like you've mentioned, is well below her station. She had been excited to go to Europe, and she never gets to go, as far as we know even though Stoner had promised her that they would. He has weighed her down to quite a degree, but her reactions do seem a little bit comical, a bit hysterical. However, I definitely disagree about Lomax and Walker. On the surface, it does seem like they are this personification of evil in their disabilities. But I saw those as character traits not show how evil they are, but rather to give motivations for their actions, to give them reasons to be suspicious of Stoner. And I found that to be more realistic. There was another review that I read, and I wish I could remember who wrote it, that talked about all of the characters in the book and how everyone makes decisions in this book, and they're all terrible decisions, and yet because of the way they are written, you understand where everyone is coming from. You understand everyone's motivations. And I found that to be true. I found that to be more true with Lomax and Walker. Certainly more true than with Edith. But even with Edith, I understood why she was upset. You know, I actually don't agree with that. I'm kind of with Iad here. I don't think Edith is particularly well rendered. And I think that any kind of explanation you kind of have to provide on your own terms. I don't think there's enough for me from the book to say that she's doing X because of Y. I actually found her to just kind of be an inexplicable character. But she's just kind of a flat character, like Yed was saying. And I think books can have, you know, this kind of flat character. I just found her befuddling. Like, I don't understand most of the reasons for why she's doing what she's doing. And I feel like you might just ascribe it to her just being a bit odd, like mentally off. I think that's what Elaine Showalter would have raised her hand about and said, you know, there's two female characters in this book. Well, two main female characters. And one of them is this ridiculous caricature and well i don't know if i agree with that i think catherine yeah catherine is portrayed very positively she's portrayed as yeah. stoner's equal yes but out of we have two female characters and is this the whole range of well, female characters i would say it like this if i were talking to show walter maybe show walter is listening to me right now so elaine what's up Basically, the way I see it is that Edith is a cruel woman, but she's not cruel because she's a woman. We don't know exactly why she's cruel, but there is something in the novel that gives you some hints. And I think that those hints are enough. We can fill in the blanks as readers. The problem with Lomax and uh, Walker is 
is that there are exactly two disabled characters in the novel, and 100% of the disabled characters are assholes. And because 100% are assholes, it makes it harder to say that they're not assholes because they're disabled. Or there's some causal link that's going on there that it seems much stronger than just being a woman. See, the link that I saw was that there is one disabled asshole, and there's another disabled person who sees the actions of the able person putting down the asshole disabled person and thus rushes to his aid because they are together in this struggle against the the ableist world. Right. That's possible. I think we can discuss more of the specifics once we get out of the the spoiler territory, just because mm. that is one of the few kind of plot points in the book that the reader might want to save. But there is a conflict between Stoner and Lomax and Walker. And I do think it's true what you're saying, that Lomax has an affinity for Walker because of their disability. But the reason why they're in conflict in the first place is not because of their disability, but because of something that Stoner sees in Walker specifically. And I think that what Stoner sees in Walker is a valid problem. We will talk more about that in the next episode, so all of our faithful listeners should stay tuned. Yeah, I agree. Let's talk about that next week. So let's take a break now. And after the break, we'll return to my favorite topic, perfection in literature. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's talk about this book being a perfect novel. Yeah, James, you've dubbed a couple of the books that we've read perfect or near-perfect novels. The New York Times' fiction editor Morris Dickstein and Brett Easton Ellis, among others, have declared this book a perfect novel. What do you think makes it so to them? Would you agree with that? I mean, you guys both seem to not like this novel so much, so it seems like you would say no, right? Well, I did say it was technically proficient. I think it's near perfect, like technically. Well, so what do you mean by that? Because, yeah, technically, I agree. But does technique make something perfect if you don't enjoy it? Yes. I know those are two sort of separate things, but there's an enjoyment of craft and there's an enjoyment of something as a whole. Yeah, I'm talking about it on a craft level. I think on a craft level, it is really strong. I think maybe for me, the only weaknesses are some of the characterizations, not because it's offensive, but because I think he could have fleshed them out more. If I were to talk to someone about this book, I don't know that I could call it perfect, even if I can look at the sentence structure and the arc of the novel and say, yeah, this is really well done. I don't think me calling it a perfect novel says very much. No offense to Morris or James or Brett Easton Ellis or whoever, but I think calling a novel perfect, it's kind of pointless because honestly, it's not like there's one ruler that everyone has agreed upon that we're measuring novels against. It's like, there's a perfect novel for you and a perfect novel for me. And even the perfect novel for me, it depends on when I'm reading that novel and why I'm reading that novel. So it's kind of an arbitrary thing to say. It's a bit ostentatious, too, I would say. It's definitely performative. You say it's perfect just because it has that formality to it. I dub thee perfect. I think it's a definition by absence because... <laughs> 
when you say something's perfect, I think partly what you're saying is it doesn't have any glaring flaws. That's something that's meaningful. Like, there are a lot of books that do well that people would say has some kind of flaw that makes it not an enjoyable read on a different level. Not on the level of aesthetics, but on a level of craft. Because, for example, if a book is terribly plotted, you might not enjoy it because of the plot, but you might enjoy it because you like the voice. And maybe you take some kind of pleasure at reading the book, but it's still flawed. I think when someone says a book is perfect, what they mean is that when talking about all the elements of fiction, there's nothing that's so egregious that would push you out. I mean, that's something meaningful, even if it's not something very meaningful. For me, at least, I think it's not a perfect novel, even though I'm doubtful that perfection exists in that way. But I will say that, as I mentioned earlier, this broad theme, this important theme about a a human life and what makes it worth living and how to live a life with dignity is such an important thing to talk about. And it's something that's a concern for everybody that it's very difficult to get it right. And because the novel zeroes in on that theme and it really just nails it and it does it so well, I am willing to overlook a lot of other things. And so while I love this novel, I wouldn't say that it's perfect, but I will say what the novel has to recommend it is much stronger than any of its shortcomings. In general, what the novel does to satisfy the theme of what makes a life worth living is that it shows a character who is mediocre by every measure and who is unremarkable. And we learn from the outset that he's forgotten by his peers. And yet we empathize with him, even if he's so different from our lives and our motivations As James and Sam were saying earlier, I at least can understand him and I can understand how he feels constrained and how he's not able to do the things that we might choose to do in that situation. And he realizes that this frustration that he was feeling was unfounded and he regains his dignity in a very powerful way. And it shows to the reader that these external yardsticks that we measure lives against are really not as important as we might have thought. And there is heroism and there is substance even in the mediocre. And that's why I singled out that quotation earlier from Archer Sloan about the defeats and victories of the human race that are not military and not recorded in the annals of history. That to me, I think, is the major theme of the novel, that the novel really just nails 100%. So who would you recommend this novel to? I don't really know who I would recommend this novel to. I think for my very literary friends, whose tastes I know and trust, I could recommend this to them. But I feel like that's a small sliver of people in my life. I feel like most friends and family members would not enjoy this, even in the stoicism sense that we have been talking about. I don't think they would get past the disappointment and into the craft. I would definitely recommend it to students of creative writing and possibly literature. I'm not sure about literature. I would recommend it to other writers. I think if you recommend it to friends who are not in this kind of literary world, you might be prepared to uh, have them not trust you in the future on books. I think I would recommend this novel to... Men of a certain age, I think that when I was younger, I wouldn't have appreciated this novel because it's not experimental, it's not formally interesting, it's very, very plain, as we've mentioned. But the theme is so important, and I think it's important specifically to men just because of the way that society has kind of created this narrative of what men's lives should be like. And I think it's also very important to men of a certain age because I think this novel becomes more and more meaningful to the reader 
the more often you have seen the doors in life closing behind you, the more you have seen opportunities fade away. The themes emerge and become much more poignant and more meaningful the older you get. I don't disagree with you. I think it is not a difficult novel to grasp in that way. I think the lessons within are fairly clear and would be clear for most writers. My reticence comes from that I don't know how many people would want to stick it out unless they were very serious students of literature or writing, as James said. Well, sounds like we have a lot to talk about next week. Let's conclude here. Thank you for listening. You can find our reading schedule on Reddit at CanonicalPod, where we also regularly post threads for discussion. We'd love for you to join us. You can also find us on social media at CanonicalPod. That's CanonicalPod, one word. We'll be back next week with an in-depth discussion of Stoner. If you're interested in joining our discussion, please go ahead and find a copy of this book. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon.